Hey, good morning. It's Wednesday, February the 22nd. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, and welcome back to Open Mics with Dr. Stites. They say age is just a number. Those people never grew old, actually, because age is more than a number. But that was never more true for the man than for the man you're going to meet today. Most doctors would have denied him a life-saving procedure because of his age. But as Alexis Del Cid shows us, some rules are indeed meant to be broken. Jim, how are you? I'm doing good, very good, thank you. That's fantastic. Fantastic is not the word Dr. Zubair Shah would have ever used to describe Jim Wagner in August of 2021, not by a long shot. When I saw the echo, my thought was, how is he still alive? Let's be honest, how is he still alive is the last question you ever want your doctor asking about you. But here he was, with a heart apparently only functioning at 30%. His thickness in the heart so severe, the cavity size so small, Dr. Shaw told them he'd never seen anything like it. And so you're just like um, numb, frightened. On top of that, Jim and his wife Marlene were stunned. They had only made the appointment and driven to the University of Kansas Health System from their home in Nebraska to meet Dr. Shaw to simply make the case for getting into one of Dr. Shaw's clinical trials. Immediately when I saw the images, I said, Jim, let's not talk about trial. This is something more serious than trial. And he basically told us that uh, of 100 patients, I was the worst one he was treating at that time and that my only hope would be a transplant. A heart transplant, and Jim was about to turn 74. His age would typically be a big red flag for many doctors who would say his age automatically ruled him out as a candidate for a new heart. Thank goodness Dr. Shaw didn't look at my actual birth date. He looked at me as a, as a person um, and didn't just look at my age. Dr. Shaw says he looked at Jim's health, which was otherwise excellent. He'd been exercising an hour a day for more than 50 years. He worked full time and Jim ate a pristine diet. And in Dr. Shaw's book, all of these factors made Jim the perfect candidate for a new heart. Jim Wagner is now is joining us remotely now. Good morning, Jim. Pleasure to meet you here in the program. Good morning, nice to see you. And also nice joining us remotely you. is Dr. Zabair Shaw, transplant cardiologist and director of the Cardiac Amyloid Program here at the Health System. There's a little bit of a hint of what's going on. And also here in the studio is Dr. Matt Danter, Jim's uh, transplant surgeon, who is also the Health System's surgical director of cardiac transplant and mechanical circulatory support. Welcome to you all and thanks for being with us, Jim. You've had your new heart for about a year, year and a half. Has it changed your life? Well, looking back, um, I, uh, I came down to see Dr. Shaw August 28th of 2021, and that's, you heard what he told me at that time. And so we came back to Lincoln, picked up some things, and I was admitted into the hospital on August 30th. 45 days later, I walked out of the hospital with this new heart. And I was just telling Dr. Shaw that night, my daughter lives in Kansas City. I went home and I grilled them salmon. And uh, looking back, it's kind of like my life had, I took a sabbatical from life where I had a bit of an intermission. Because even though I was diagnosed in 2018, I was largely asymptomatic until the summer of 2021 when I started struggling with my workouts. Uh, very, uh, you know, I, I didn't know at the time I was probably going in and out of atrial fibrillation. I was working on some continuing education uh, via internet. I'd go back to my office from the Y and I, I couldn't stay awake. So, uh, the fact that, you know, it, it kind of progressed rapidly, but I had the transplant and recovered rapidly. So it's, it's like my life was normal, then it wasn't normal. And now I'm largely back to normal because I really haven't had, I mean, many major issues with, with this whole ordeal. Now we're gonna talk about some medical questions, but first I need to ask how good your grilled salmon? 
It is excellent. It's fantastic. I can't. I need to have try that. I love grilled salmon. Okay, so now, when you went to this appointment, you thought you're going to be in a research study, but suddenly that turned, and it turned in a pretty dramatic way. What was your reaction when Dr. Shaw said you need a new heart, not a, a research trial? Well, it was shocking, and, and it's even more shocking when, when I tell a little bit more about my previous history because I was being treated by a cardiology group in Nebraska. And uh, I actually saw that cardiologist who was an expert in, you know, quotes expert, an alleged expert in amyloidosis on July 2nd of 2021. I found my way to Dr. Shaw, as I said, August 28th. After my visit, my visit with my cardiologist in Nebraska, he gave me no indication of how sick I was, and he actually sent me home with a prescription of Lasix. And it's just the antithesis of what Dr. Shaw, how he treated me, because this doctor in Nebraska must have looked at my birthday and he didn't even have the courtesy to tell me how sick I was probably should not have been driving um, in any event so yeah to, to, to say it was shocking to say is is an understatement and again thank God dr. Shaw looked at it differently so dr. Shaw you it sounds like you were a, a pretty important figure here in Jim's wife in the Jim's life tell us what was wrong with mr. Wagner's heart yes uh, so Jim has uh, something which was kind of relatively complex what we call is wild type or age related ATTR cardiac amyloidosis uh, what happens is we all have a carrier protein called uh, transthyretin short name TTR and in some patients or in some people with age, this protein becomes unstable and breaks down. And these bro uh, broken pr products, these breakdown products build on the heart and cause heart to get thicker and thicker at the cost of the cavity, as well as make heart very stiff. So we have one of the biggest amyloid uh, program uh, in, in the U.S. And uh, Jim uh, uh, was at the severe spectrum of cardiac amyloidosis is, you know, normal male adults cavity size is 70 to 120 mLs. I think his cavity was just 25 mLs, very small cavity. And on top of that, heart was very stiff. And then his heart function had also fallen down. So to summarize, heart was barely pumping any blood out to keep organs alive. So as Jim said, he came to get into a trial. He had this amyloid, I would say, at least for 10 years. And he came to get into the trial. But when I saw his echo pictures, his ECG, I mean, this would not have uh, reversed with, with treatment. And uh, examination-wise also, he was in low flow state. Uh, so uh, we had to admit him immediately to CICU. And uh, I had a detailed conversation with him and transplant is an evaluation, uh, so we started evaluating him. So really, normally the heart expands a lot when you get blood and it comes in your back, and the left side of the heart kind of expands, then it can pump stuff out. In this case, what it sounds like is the heart couldn't really expand, so even when it pumped, there wasn't much to pump because it never really loaded. Is that fair? That's, that's exactly right so the cavity is so small it's not able to when heart returns from the lungs oxygenated blood heart kind of expands and then squeezes back his cavity was so thick heart would not expand it will it will not take any blood from the uh, from the lungs so blood will backflow into the right side so so it was a very difficult very severe form of restrictive infiltrative heart failure so this sounds a little like my wife thinking I have a thick head sometime and I can't hear what she's saying, you know what I'm saying? And then I, I don't, I can't get done what I'm supposed to get done. And, and uh, I think I, a thick head or something like that. So is there an age limit for transplant or? I mean, there is not a hard l l line. Generally program, some programs stop at 70, some at 72. It has more to do with frailty, organ availability. 
uh, and Jim was, we had done 72s, but uh, Jim was 73, going to be 74. So it all depends on, you know, other patient criteria also, how well they are, other organs, frailty, functional status. And Jim, as uh, as he said, was in excellent shape. There was no contra, no hard contraindication. I mean, age is, in my opinion, soft contraindication. Other than that, end organ function was uh, very good. He was in very good shape. I, I, if Jim remembers, I made him walk also to see how uh, how good he is before I I spoke about transplant. So to su uh, summarize, it's a soft contraindication, but but we l look at patients on individual basis. If there are no other contraindications, you know, uh, uh, we can go up to 75, 76. So I'm interested that. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of end-stage lung disease, work with some other programs outside here for lung transplant, but, but one of the things we preach is exercise, exercise, exercise. Do you think Jim Wagner was still alive because he had exercised so much and that kept him much healthier to be able to, to, to handle the difficulty he had with his heart disease and set him up for a heart transplant? Absolutely. He, he, was, uh, he was in very good shape. Uh, and I'm certain that's why that's why he survived this long with that low flow. And on top of that, he did excellent post transplant. He went home day eight and was, as he said, uh, was helping to <laughs> grill. I think grilled himself uh, salmon on day eight and didn't even had pain. He was just taking Tylenol post op. So all of this is because, in my opinion, he was in excellent shape. He wasn't. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. So, uh, uh, Dr. Shaw, have you had Mr. Wagner's salmon yet? Have you had it? I've not. <laughs> Dr. Have Dr. Not. Dr. have you had that salmon? No salmon for me. Okay, no. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Wagner, I'm just saying. I'm thinking there's a salmon deficit here in the room. All right, Dr. Danner, you have transplant hearts for a living, and you transplanted a gym. You ever done this with a 74-year-old before? Uh, once before when I was at Vanderbilt, yeah. I think Dr. Shaw said it well. Age is a relative contraindication, and we were talking about it before the program that um, you know, the relative age limits for transplant have not changed since I started medical school 117 years ago. So the, the realities are that we take the person as a whole and I think we have adopted one of the strategies that one of my other mentors, another Dr. Shaw at Vanderbilt said, which is, if not us, who? So that's our approach to it. Yeah, and I think that, that makes a lot of sense because age can be a very relative number. But there's also a shortage of organs out there. So do we do, is it wrong to submit, to, to transplant someone who's already been a little older than someone who's younger? I know that can be an ethical debate in the transplant community. Uh, I don't think it's wrong. I think if we didn't have the multidisciplinary committees we have and we didn't have the very... Um, thoughtful approaches to each patient as an individual, then you could uh, question, you know, transplanting every 74-year-old or every 76-year-old. But the scarcity of resources does make that a relevant conversation. But I think that particularly in the individual basis, you could make the argument the other direction too, that is it ageist to discriminate against a group of people solely based on their age when literally Mr. Wagner was in better shape than his heart transplant surgeon at the time of his transplant other than, you know, his heart function, so. Well, you know, there's something about how well you've taken care of yourself in order to be, because I'm, I'm with you, age is just a relative number. I try to tell my kids that all the time, I'm really not old, I'm just more wise. So, um, you mentioned taking a look at the whole person, not just the number. What are the concerns that you have, though, for people who are not 45, but 65 or 75 and thinking about transplant? Predominantly, I'd say post-op recovery and preoperative failure, uh, frailty would be the, the biggest one. So someone who isn't mobile, someone who is already relatively debilitated preoperatively is not a good candidate for a haircut even, you know what I mean? But, the, uh, but for someone who is fit and active and um, otherwise free of major absolute contraindications, things like smoking and diabetic control and these kind of things, then I think you take it as a case-by-case -case basis, really. But the fact that you live a healthy lifestyle and get to 74 or even older with a single system problem means that you've been taking care of yourself. So I think that 
it portends a very good outcome afterwards. The biggest concern that we all have for anyone who's a little uh, more elderly is post-op recovery and ability to tolerate any complications. You know, we, we like to, uh, to celebrate our, our successes and things like this, but we also have to recognize that someone who's 75 can't take and recover from a stroke the same way a uh, younger person can, or even, you know, people with degrees of frailty don't respond and recover as well. So that's why it's very important to have a multidisciplinary approach and to ensure that we have input from our physiotherapists and our uh, rehab physicians about the appropriateness and the likelihood of people being able to recover after a major operation. So it's really about that getting back mobilized and making sure you do get a quicker recovery or, or a, a rapid recovery so you don't have some of those difficult yeah. complications that can happen. Have we transplanted other 70 year olds? Yes. Okay, so this several, and I bet they're all kind of have that same story as Mr. Wagner. I work hard at trying to stay healthy and stay alive, even up to the uh, to the point of transplant. Yes. All right, so now, Mr. Wagner, just a couple of questions here. Um, I'm going to assume you've been very active in the last year and a half since your transplant. Is that accurate? That is very accurate. Um, I, I can say I got out of the hospital eight days the next day. I, well, I walked in the hospital every day while I was waiting for my heart. I, uh, I, I, I was in multiple rooms, and nurses would come in and say, well, I, we've need, I haven't taken care of you, but we see you walking all the time. So I walked even when I was in the hospital. Out of the hospital, uh, I was back, you know, I was encouraged by all of you to exercise, which was not hard for me because... Um, I become an avid exerciser in the early early 1971 when I got out of college. I worked out six, seven days a week um, before transplant, and I'm doing that again. And uh, you know, 50, 40, 50 minutes of cardio, and trying to do some weights, and uh, it's not work for me. I enjoy working out. Now that that is really amazing. We saw the picture of you working out. You're doing it six or seven days a week. That's great. Are you still? Do you still hold down a job too? Yes, I've uh, been in the insurance business. Uh, April first will be my 52nd year, and I uh, still enjoy my clients. Uh, you know, I don't work like I did 10 years ago, but uh, as long as I'm physically and mentally capable, I enjoy what I do and uh, intend to continue doing it. Are you ever going to retire to make salmon or whatever? Well, um, I think we all retire, don't we? Uh, like I said, uh, I'll know when it's time or someone will tell me. <laughs> but I will say I, an I answer the phone at the office and I think sometimes are amazed. They say, you're still there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah, I was talking to the nurse who worked nurse for 20 years. Yeah, sometimes they're hoping for voicemail and they get me. <laughs> yeah. I've been working with the same nurse now for 20 years. I said to her yesterday, listen, when I'm not very smart anymore, you have to make sure I don't hurt anybody or you got to tell me that I don't, don't do something dumb here. So there you go. All right, so listen, there's a couple of things I want to just point out here. So if you want to learn more about heart transplants here at the system, we're putting a link in a QR code up. Scan the code or go to the website bit.com. L slash or uh, dash Y slash new heart in all caps. That's bit dot um, L hyphen Y slash new heart in all caps or just scan the QR code. You'll learn all about heart transplant here. And um, you can see why uh, Mr. Wagner has done so darn well. We've got a great team of people who are working around that. So Mr. Wagner, last question. Have you made some lifestyle changes? Well, I think another huge part of my uh, fitness when I got down there, nu nutrition uh, has, has, was also another major factor for me. Uh, my daughter actually got her master's and PhD at KU Med and, and uh, worked in the integrative medicine department there. So when my son got cancer in 2011, he had Nodge Hodgkin's lymphoma, we really ratcheted it up. We uh, had an apartment in San Diego. We cooked all his food and uh, largely organic. And uh, my family did the same thing for me when I was in hospitalized. Fortunately, my daughter lived just 10 minutes from the hospital. 
So I, I really want to shout out to promotion and what she and, and be largely organic and eat as healthy as we possibly can. And I think that's a huge factor in all my recovery. So you guys are really a KU family, and uh, I bet you know the Rock Chalk chant then. Well, I've become a, a KU fan. Yeah, I say I graduated from the KU Med Center. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Shaw, I saw you shaking your head yes when you, uh, when you heard about lifestyle modification. Anything you want to put in there? Because I, I know you're a strong believer. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Jim, you know, especially post-transplant, we expect patients to take excellent care of that organ. It's kind of an obligation. And uh, I mean, healthy diet, low salt, low sodium, uh, low fat diet, less carbs, and Jim has been doing that off his own. Generally, we have to educate uh, our transplant. Once they get the transplant, they have appointments and we educate them about healthy diet. Uh, we really uh, have a faith in that, and he has been doing that by himself. I bet. And first thing he does is have grilled salmon. I love, uh, as I said, I love salmon. I g I'm giving up bacon for let, by golly. All right, so now, uh, except for Sundays, I think I can, I think I can do that on Sunday. Um, the uh, other thing I just wanted to touch base on, I'm 63. Can I be a donor? How, how old can you be a donor for a heart? Again, that's, there's a number of relative uh, contraindications. 63 might be pushing it a little bit, mm -hmm. to be honest, but it depends on uh, looking at both the donor characteristics and then really often what your, your recipient characteristics are. Because if you've got a critically ill person who's literally on as much support as we can keep them alive with, then you would have a lower threshold for taking a, an organ that may or may not be what we determine to be <coughs> totally perfect. And we've looked at, you know, during the early 2000s and uh, uh, things looking at sort of marginal donors for marginal candidates and these kind of things. And what was born out of that was a lot of the hep C stuff was actually, um, so the ability to take hep C donors with the advent of new medications. So it did depend. 63 though it is, is maybe pushing it. Okay, thanks for a lot for that. I appreciate it. Glad to fill for that heart, way. anyways. Oh, I got, oh, I got it. Listen, he's got this perfect looking hair up there and all that. You know, Shaw, I think you and I should make him be a, a, a hair donor. I think you got to give us a little bit of support Absolutely. here. What do you think? Absolutely. All right, Absolutely. <laughs> all right. I'm sure our viewers have some great questions for our guests today. They always do. Um, get your send in to us now on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and the Medical News Network. You'll find links to those right here on your screen. Jessica will join us in a few moments with those questions. Next, let's check in with Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control here at the Health System. Doc Hawk, yeah. how are the COVID numbers looking today? COVID numbers are, are unfortunately holding steady and really uh, not decreasing too much. Uh, active infections are still in that mid-20s range, but right now we have uh, 51 total of those, 26 are active, uh, still five in the ICU and th three on the ventilator. Overall this week though, Steve, we've had um, a higher proportion in the ICU than we've seen recently, yeah. unfortunately. You know, we're kind of stuck. Yeah. We're stuck between 45 and 55, mm -hmm. not loving the stuck. No, no, I mean, you know, I think we are saying this is probably the best measure of actual circulation of the virus out in the community because we know the testing and case rates um, that are reported are probably not as accurate. But unfortunately, we are still seeing these people coming in to the hospital. And, you know, I, I got a consult from one of them yesterday. Again, most all of these people have significant comorbidities associated with that as well. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it is uh, just a good reminder yeah. that even though we want it to go away, it's still here. Mm -hmm. It may not be what it was, but it's still a threat. The best way to keep yourself safe is vaccination, which we're going to turn to in just a moment, yeah. along with if you're around a high risk area to go ahead and put a mask on. Yeah. Hey, a, a new study is reinforcing our belief earlier, Hawk, that yeah. ivermectin doesn't work. It came out in JAMA this week. Talk mm -hmm. to us about that. You know, early on, ivermectin was hailed as this, this miracle drug. I was skeptical. My hypothesis was it wasn't. 
uh, effective. We always wanted that good data, that supportive data. The data that initially supported it was found to be uh, falsified and untrue. Uh, we wanted those good studies, that peer-reviewed studies. This is one more piece of that. Um, they actually looked at higher dosing of ivermectin than, than they were using previously to help reduce chance of hospitalization and also help reduce days of symptoms. And what it found was that ivermectin, even at a higher dose, had no effect, no benefit compared to taking nothing at all. So really supportive treatment for those, uh, for most people is good. Obviously, if you're high risk, you wanna get tested early, get treated with Paxlovid um, if you need to be. Uh, but ivermectin, really, this is one more uh, piece just saying that uh, it is it is not effective and there really should be no use for ivermectin in this infection at all. Still some good news out there though that the bivalent vaccination does continue to work and actually some of the original yeah. vaccination continues yeah. to work too. Yeah absolutely and, and we believe uh, this is because of those memory B cells, which are creating antibodies, but also especially those memory T cells to help prevent uh, that severe illness. Now, again, the vaccination maybe can help protect against infection itself, but that is only for several weeks after you get your vaccination dose. More impor importantly, you are continuing to have that T cell immunity. Um, there is good data to continue to support that the bivalent, the current vaccines are still effective, uh, but also even against these new variants, it seems that our antivirals such as remdesivir, Paxlovid continue to be effective as well. We know that the mono, uh, monoclonal antibodies are no longer effective, but I think we have good measures in place. Um, keep up to date with those vaccine recommendations, but also get tested early and of course get on the antivirals. You know, one thing that came out in this week's New England Journal of Medicine or the week of February 16th, um, respiratory vi uh, syncytial virus, RSV vaccination. Yeah. For the first time, pretty big breakthrough. Yeah, absolutely. That RSV vaccines may be effective in reducing disease by as much as 83%. Yeah. For transplant patients, that would be a huge deal. And for all patients. Yeah, absolutely. And we know that it is the very young, so those under a year, but also the elderly people who are most affected by this. And I think even this year in our hospital, we had more uh, adult patients. But again, the caveat being we are more of an adult hospital. Our patient population is more adults. But it is a significant uh, disease for that elderly population as well. So that's what these uh, two newest vaccines are really focused towards to helping prevent severe disease from that. And like you said, over 80% in preventing severe disease. And I think it was over 90% preventing death as well. And that is a very good thing. That is what Dr. Barney Graham originally started to work on um, prior to transitioning over very quickly into the, uh, the COVID vaccines. But uh, it is a very good breakthrough and hopefully will help prevent a lot of morbidity and mortality from RSV in the adult population, whether that's elderly, elderly or like you said, in the immune suppressed population like transplant population. So not available yet, but I suspect if this data holds true and continues mm -hmm. to progress that we're gonna see RSV vaccination, which is a major breakthrough. It causes a lot of disease in kids yeah. um, and a lot of disease in, 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 I know, in a lung transplant population um, and a CF population, asthma populations, RSV is a bad, yeah. bad thing. And I think they are working on a pediatric vaccine, but I think it was one and then there were the, those two adult vaccines. So, so exciting yeah. news breaking through. Last question. There was something that mm. CNN put out there a while back yeah. that said, if you get if you get COVID, you're, you're good for 10 months. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, one. I mean, it was a good publication. It was in The Lancet, a very respected uh, in, uh, journal. But we have to take this article um, and this study for what it's worth. It is a meta-analysis, so it means it puts multiple, multiple uh, studies together. I think they did... Um, 19 different countries in, in a span of like 60 some articles about that um, and, and research articles during that time. So they compared them all and put them together. Um, but I think it also does, it is consistent with what we said as we know that, you know, infection, it will build immunity. Um, you will get immunity not only to spike, which you get from the vaccine, but other pieces of that virus. You will still build up an immunity um, and we are hoping as we have hoped that through time, as our bodies or especially younger generations have earlier and earlier exposure to SARS-CoV-2, it won't po uh, pose the problem that it has now. Um, now, a lot of the study was done in the pre-Omicron area. They did have several studies during the Omicron when looking at the ancestral strains, whether that's 
alpha, beta, delta, and then comparing that to reinfection with Omicron. Certainly that protection was much less, but I think the main importance is that you do mount an immune response. You still do have immunity, you gain immunity to hospitalization and severe disease, even with natural infection. But the thing, Steve, we've always talked about, it's much safer to get the vaccine to help prevent those other problems as well. So um, overall good news, hopefully as a population, uh, as a globe, we are gaining that population immunity where SARS-CoV-2 won't become uh, the, the devastating issue that it has been. But you said, like we said right now, we are still seeing a lot of patients in the hospital. Um, but we know that we can mount some immune response to it and at least some protection to help protect most people against severe disease. Yeah, best way to stay out of the hospitals, make sure you take good care of yourself, yeah. exercise regularly, get vaccinated, whether yeah. it's from <laughs> SARS, COVID-2, RSV, influenza, yeah. we can keep you safer. Jess, what do you got going on out there? Hey, good morning, Dr. Stites. Yes, a few questions from our community today. Joe Ellen wants to know, um, how do our guests define fit and active for those over 70? How do they measure that? That's a great question. Dr. Shaw, I'm listening. I'm getting close. So, so far, uh, for in uh, our world, I prefer to do six minute walk distance test. It's kind of a way, uh, it's kind of a very rough estimate how fit uh, a person is, how his, uh, how a person's cardio metabolic activity is. We make patient walk for six minutes and see the distance covered. Generally speaking, uh, excellent physical capacities if they are able to walk more than 380 meters. About 300 is good. 250 to 300 is average and below 250 is poor. And that's what we did when I saw Jim, I made him walk for six uh, minutes. I, uh, he did excellent. So it's a medical definition, but is there a lifestyle definition? Mm -hmm. How much would you, should you recommend that somebody is exercising on a daily basis? And I know that changes. We could do a whole program just on exercise recommendations in the elderly. Actually, we probably should do an entire program mm -hmm. on exercise recommendations in the elderly. But what do you look for in the heart transplant patients outside of when you test them, uh, Dr. Shaw? At least half an hour of cardio. Uh, that could be treadmill. That could be bike. That could be uh, walking every day uh, is excellent uh, and uh, yeah. that's what we look into uh, uh, yeah that's what day. that's what i tell the lung patients you know you need to do 20 30 minutes every day at least six days a week and if you can't go very fast i don't care how fast you go it's the fact that you went for a while and once you get up to 20 minutes a day then you can start going a little faster but start slow just get it done all right jess Steve is asking the doctors if they think that this research on age might actually apply to other kinds of procedures besides heart transplants. Dr. Danter, you're the procedure guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think that the take home message is that age should be considered a relative contraindication to any procedure. Um, if you think about it, there's probably no other procedure other than transplant in some form or other, liver, kidney, whichever uh, organ that you're talking about, that is more strict about uh, you know, assuring that you're, um, or ensuring that the people who are undergoing this uh, relatively scarce gift are in a reasonable condition to take it. So if you think of expanding in the transplant space, it should logically follow that age should, and for many of us, is a, just a relative um, sort of measure of whether someone can tolerate any operation. And of course, it, you know, if we're talking about you know, ingrown toenails or brain tumor resection, there are different paradigms and there's different parameters for those different procedures. But on the whole, we should take a look at the person as an individual, and there is a good body of evidence that suggests there is a stark, stark difference between chronologic age and physiologic age. 
So you know, I think <clears> the key <throat> is you, we have 40, 30, 40, 50 year olds who can barely move around successfully. We have 70 year olds out there climbing 14ers in, in Colorado, yeah. and and I think it, it's it's what it's what you put into it, you return. And and uh, you know, I was on the exercise bike for 30 minutes today. I'll be a much better person, much less crabby. Friday I'll be 45 minutes pushing some weights. Saturday's gonna be an hour and a half. You know, you've got to dedicate yourself to it if you're going to be successful with it. I know Hawkeye spends a lot of time in the gym as well. That's why people like his t-shirts. Jess. Last question is from Alan. Alan is wondering, other than age, what are some of the other things that might disqualify someone from getting a heart transplant? Dr. Shaw, I bet there are a few. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, frailty is important as Dr. Kenter said, people who are not able to do much pre-transplant had uh, uh, had a poor functional status to start with will not be able to improve their their functional start, status if frailty is too much. Then other organs, if their kidneys are involved, although we can look into heart kidney, we are doing dual organs, but generally heart kidney, advanced diabetes, if they have complications of diabetes, eyes, peripheral uh, vascular disorders, weight, because post-transplant patients gain weight, so BMI of 38 is a soft uh, contraindication for us. Then something we call pulmonary hypertension, too high, too very high pressures in their uh, lungs can be a contraindication. Last but not least, active cancer also. Uh, if we transplant them, we are not going to improve their quality or their lifespan if they are going through an active cancer. And then also tobacco use. Yeah, I'm going smoking or yeah. other types of illicit Other types of use, tobacco use and, and vaping. Alcohol. Vaping is actually something that we've had to consider as essentially smoking. Yeah, well, as it should be. Yeah. The, the health impacts of vaping are terrible, and, and uh, those who think it's safe are just not right. So um, we it, clearly in this transplant world, I think the, 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 the normally the, the way we look at it is you, get, you shouldn't have other significant end organ disease besides the organ you're being transplanted. If you have bad liver disease, you're getting a heart, eh, that's not such a good combination unless you're gonna get a liver and a heart at the same time or sometimes we do liver, lung, and cystic fibrosis. But normally, you really have to be otherwise healthy. And the older you get, the more important I think that I, that, that rule becomes. All right, well, um, this has been a great program today, and, and uh, I really want to thank Mr. Wagner for being a part of this program and for demonstrating to all of us what it can be like to be fit, healthy, working, and having fun over 70 and being a good cook, although we, we don't really have proof of the last part. We just have your word on that. So um, well, hopefully someday we'll get a chance to, 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 to find that out. Let's get final thoughts from some, some folks. Mr. Wagner. Well, I'm kind of sorry I brought up the salmon, but... Uh, <laughs> no, I, I love salmon. I just love to mess with people. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I've always said, uh, I, I just can't thank the people at KU Med enough. And I, and I always say from top to bottom, uh, from the person that comes in to scan your medical equipment, inventory, to the people to bring your food in, to, you know, Clinton has been fantastic. Uh, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Dan, everybody from top to bottom has treated me fantastic, and thank you very much for that. Oh, that's awesome. What a great team. Dr. Shaw, final thoughts. Yeah, I will uh, focus on the age part we spoke about with people l living no uh, longer than uh, in, the, in the previous era. I think we should look into elderly people seriously when it comes to advanced therapies, transplant and VAD. We are offering VAD for older patients uh, now if they are otherwise fit. So take home is uh, we want to look into age uh, more seriously advanced people to offer them uh, uh, to offer them heart failure therapies. That is awesome. All right, Dr. Danter. Yeah, I think, you know, from a programmatic standpoint, as we grow, we're able to to expand sort of what would traditionally or perhaps in the past not been something that we would pursue. But I think, you know, adopting a philosophy of not us, if not us who, is is sort of the thrust of this program for heart failure. And it's a terrible disease. It's, it has survival rates worse than almost every cancer. And we have therapies now that are very effective, both in VAD and transplant. So I think that 
for physicians out there that may be watching in the community, just you know, consider this as a possibility. If you have patients with heart failure, then there are options other than medical therapy and when people have failed medical therapy and then, you know, basically the people here are extremely receptive at um, discussing patients and, and accepting patients to be seen with heart failure and I think that as we've seen in the last two episodes that I've been on anyways, a 78 year old gentleman who got a LVAD and went back to being an airline mechanic or an airplane mechanic and then Mr. Wagner here. So there are options for people with failing hearts. Age is relative. Dr. Doc Hawk. Yeah. No, I, I think this was a great show, you know, for the specifics of uh, the heart transplant, but also for the general topic of just uh, being fit, being healthy. And it is difficult in this day and age, for sure. It takes that conscious decision, but it does start with, with one footstep, you know, no pun intended. But things like getting adequate sleep, you know, we are always asked about how do I protect myself uh, from COVID or how do I improve my immune function? This is just overall functioning. Um, and having a healthy lifestyle does, uh, just reading an article, does help protect and reduce your risk of long COVID. But it also helps protect from other uh, adverse outcomes from things like infe other infectious diseases as well. Uh, if you are having that healthy lifestyle, adequate sleep, adequate nutrition, uh, moderate to vigor vigorous physical activity, no excessive alcohol intake, smoking we heard is one of the major ones. You know, those things will all help improve your outcomes should something happen down the road, such as needing a heart transplant, having to undergo chemotherapy, um, having a bone marrow transplant. We've heard about, about Dr. McGurk and his team talking about that. So healthy lifestyle is vitally important. It is difficult, we do understand it, but it also helps if you make that conscious decision and just do one step at a time. You know, um, I think we have brought new meaning to the great turn of phrase. You guys all know what I'm about to say, right? Live long and prosper. <laughs> and it means even more when we hear stories of the day. And Mr. Wagner, we are delighted that you have both lived long and prospered. Congratulations. Thank you. Jess, back to you. Dr. Seitz, thanks so much. Thanks to all of our guests and to our viewers today. Tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update, our newest installment of Where Are They Now? One COVID patient faced months of severe symptoms, but did her pregnancy play a role in her recovery? We find out Thursday at 8. I'm Alexis Del Cid. On the next All Things Heart. There's no way to say thank you. How do you say thank you for receiving a donor's heart? An epic health journey all leading up to this moment. Cancer, life-changing surgery, and then a transplant. The multiple battles this woman faced before receiving the gift of life, Thursday at 10 a.m. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stein's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.